All right. Thank you, Kent. Um, actually, I, I also want to thank uh, David Landsman, who really did a fabulous job organizing this meeting, um, who worked with Dennis Benson on that and some others at NCBI. I want to thank all the folks who manned the tables and so forth out there. Um, I really want to thank the uh, participants, the speakers, who, who uh, uh, many of them, besides being very good friends uh, and colleagues, uh, gave some great talks. In fact, I modified my talk on the basis of hearing a number of them. I was so stimulated. My wife was a little upset that I was playing around with the slides late at night, but it was just uh, it was very interesting. Um, obviously, GenBank wouldn't be possible without uh, contributions from many folks and the support of many folks. Uh, NIH uh, had the vision uh, under Ruth, Ruth Kirstein's work at NIGMS to, to start GenBank. Um, and NCBI has really benefited from fantastic support uh, from the institute directors uh, across NIH and from the NIH directors. Um, uh, I'm not going to say this the right way, but it's, it's great to have a boss who's got guts. Uh, besides starting uh, uh, NCBI, having the vision to start it, uh, Dr. Lindbergh has guts. You know, whenever there was something that came along that could have rocked a few boats and upset the apple cart and we'd discuss it together, he'd just give it some thought and say, yeah, go right ahead. And uh, so we've, we've upset some apple carts, carts but it's, it's been a lot of fun and I, I don't think, I can't think of another leader that, for the library that would have allowed us to accomplish as much as, uh, as Don has. So thank you very much for that. Um, In addition, uh, I obviously have to thank co my colleagues at NCBI, those both working directly uh, on GenBank and those who uh, don't really work directly on it, but the way things go at NCBI, everybody's contributing to more than, more than two or three projects. Um, it's, it's really an honor to work with um, folks as dedicated and as talented uh, as uh, my colleagues at NCBI, and, um, and it's also for me just a tremendous pleasure. It's, it's a privilege to come in and, and just bump into folks who I've worked with and uh, can be so impressed when I, of course, I don't watch see each project, so when I look at it, it seems like a huge amount has happened, even though for some of you it seems like things are moving slowly. Um, and as an aside, I also want to thank those who used to work at NCBI, who some of you have come to this meeting, and uh, it's great to see you again. And finally, I want to thank uh, the international DNA sequence collaborators, uh, um, Takashi and Graham and, uh, and their teams. It's, it's, uh, it's really pretty amazing that we've worked together for so many years. Uh, and really, I think we're, we're, we're making the collaboration deeper and stronger. Uh, with every year, uh, the projects get more complicated that each group faces, and to be able to actually keep a working collaboration, uh, which gets more complex all the time, keep it going. It, it, I, I give all the folks uh, from uh, uh, DDBJ and EMBL a, a tremendous amount of credit. <laughs> all right, well, now I'll get on with my talk. So, so I'm going to breeze through a few things. I'm going to try and have fun along with it. and, and uh, I um, hope it's fun for you as well. First, going to say a few words about, well, you know, why is GenBank at the library? Because I think for some folks it's a bit of a puzzling thing. Um, I want to give a few examples of GenBank's greatest hits, but in particular ones that illustrate certain aspects of some of the early findings uh, from the first days of, of GenBank onward. Um, a, a little bit because of, of the overall patterns of these hits and so forth, uh, efforts on classification and a and a genomic perspective uh, on, on the kinds of relationships that have been found over the last 25 years, and then end up a, a, with a little bit of a, more of a question than an answer about what is this telling us about biological systems. Well, I, uh, oh, this is going to be tough because some of these, uh, the black ones, you're not going to be able to see anything, but that's okay. Nothing special there. Uh, this beautiful picture here is from the NIGMS uh, website, and uh, that was, DNA sequencing and molecular biology and molecular genetics, in my mind, uh, when I first was learning about it, it was just sort of something very exciting and it was the future. Um, and, well, that was the library. Uh, you know, we just, it was puzzling to me when I was hearing that uh, uh, the NLM was going to get this new center going uh, uh, to, uh, to do research in computer methods and molecular biology and develop information resources. I just 
didn't know enough about NLM at the time to, to see the connection. Well, as I learned more about it, uh, uh, NLM has always been a pioneer uh, with information technology for organizing bibliographic information and information retrieval. Um, it was probably one of the first places at the NIH that was working with Unix and, 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 and uh, uh, actually the, pre the predecessor for the internet, the ARPANET, and, uh, and, and so it was already keyed in on a lot of the new, new things going on in information technology. Um, in the early days of sequencing, most of the sequencing was done on genes for which there was already a lot of biological information, and the ratio of sequences to papers was, was kind of low, so that the connection to the literature for the paper that actually published the sequence, there was a lot of good biological function information in that paper, so the, it was a very simple connection and a useful one. Uh, obviously, a key thing about the sur surprising sequence matches, and we'll go over a few of that, in a minute, is that it brings together disparate research areas. So, so if you're working on a gene and you search it against the database and you find a match to something that's outside your area, whether it's, you know, from immunology to um, neuroscience or from uh, uh, mouse genetics to uh, worm genetics, uh, it's very helpful to have a, a, a convenient and, 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 and deep connection to the literature. And finally, a number of the speakers have made this point already, um, and I hope that becomes clear in my talk, that the, the richest information about biological function right now is really in the literature. It's not in specialized databases. It's, it's not in some sort of uh, mathematical framework like quantum mechanics. It's in the papers uh, that biologists are writing, and, and uh, the easiest way to learn about that is to read the papers. Okay. Uh, a very quick run through the history of how NCBI got connected uh, with uh, uh, the literature. In 1986, there were just under 8,000 papers referenced in GenBank, and we could do citation matching, uh, Jim Ostell gave it a little bit of talk on that, uh, to match almost 95 percent of those to Medline. That became what we called the Medline subset on the CD-ROM that we were distributing when we were distributing sequence information for GenBank. Um, in 93, there were 50,000 Medline records connected to the sequence database, and we would distribute the CD-ROM with that information. By 90, uh, December 93, we had 150,000 Medline records on the CD-ROM, including some that were not directly connected to the sequences. In other words, those were not sequence uh, uh, papers that published sequence, but they had such a close connection to papers that did that they were included. Now, the reason why the number was going up is because the number of sequences were going up, the number of papers connected were going up, but also, in this case in particular here, because we were hearing from our users that they liked it. In late 1994, we made available on the Internet what we called Network Entree. This was sort of pre-World uh, Wide Web, and there were 500,000 Medline records on that. That was extremely popular among our users, and uh, in 1997, for the success of all of the above, um, uh, because the World Wide Web has really, had really become the way to get information out, um, and because of sort of very open GenBank policy, I went to see Dr. Lindbergh about the possibility of taking Medline, which had been available for a very low fee uh, uh, in a variety of ways, um, to make it freely available online on the web as PubMed. And even though there could imagine a lot of resistance from many quarters on that. Dr. Lindbergh said, go ahead, let's do it. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's been a tremendous success uh, for, uh, for the biomedical community. Uh, in 2000, uh, because of the precedent of the GenBank policies of open access to the information and the even more uh, uh, forward-looking policies that Francis Collins and others had pushed for the Genome Project, where you would make the data available even before you published, uh, and the success of PubMed, Dr. Uh, Harold Varmus uh, was hearing from colleagues like Pat Brown and others about doing something for the literature, where we could make the, the published literature more open, more integrated like we were doing with all the other databases, and that led to PubMed Central. Now, PubMed Central is a full-text repository that uh, the Library of Medicine uh, 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 runs. It's an archive for the full text biomedical literature. And um, at that time, the idea was publishers could 
provide us the content, we'd put it into an archiving format and make it available freely. And this would usually be after some embargo period. Some, some journals would allow the content to be freely available in 12 months, but actually a number of journals allowed it to be available in six months, one month, and some journals even immediately. Well, PubMed Central has actually been quite successful. Even before the public access policy, we had over a million articles in it. It's one of the most heavily used databases that we have at NCBI, and it's growing all the time. As it gets bigger, we have more users. It's sort of a, uh, two curves that follow each other, track each other. And in 2008, because of the success of all of the above, and, and with PubMed Central, there was success in the sense that not only was it being popular and used, we were able to do it in a very cost-effective fashion. We developed some standards that are now being used across the industry for uh, scientific, or actually for articles in general. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Zahuni, the director of NIH, uh, on hearing from lots of folks on the issue and thinking it over, felt that uh, that that there was a need to go forward with a, a policy where even journals that weren't participating would have articles from NIH-funded research, and the idea would be that that research should go into PubMed Central as well, perhaps with a, a, an embargo period, uh, and, and an effort was started a few years ago to do that on a voluntary basis. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just like uh, with the sequencing area where a sort of an, a loosey-goosey approach doesn't really work, uh, it wasn't really getting much uh, uh, participation by the scientists, and uh, the U.S. Congress, on seeing that this was actually a good idea, following all the talks that you've heard so far where more and more access means better return on the research investment, the idea was to make this mandatory. If you got an NIH grant, then um, when you published, you would have to make it available in PubMed Central within 12 months. And yesterday, as you've heard, was the first day that that policy was taken into uh, taking place, and I really hope that this turns into a, as great a success as all these other projects, and I think it's going to have um, really big, big consequences for uh, discovery in biomedical research. Okay, just a few of GenBank's greatest hits. Well, I wanted to start with something which was sort of in the earliest days of GenBank, just a little bit before GenBank. Um, uh, talked this over with Eugene Koonin, and, you know, how can you ignore the Walker motif. The, the, the thing about this, this uh, discovery, I was asking Rich, I don't know of another sequence motif that actually has somebody's name attached to it. Maybe there is one, but uh, you know, anybody who works on sequences knows what a Walker motif is. And, and what was interesting about this discovery of a sequence similarity is it really reflects how molecular biology was done with sequence data at the time, which was, you had to know an area very well, you knew a lot about the biology, and then you'd finally spend the money and the time to get the sequence. And in this case, what uh, Walker and his colleagues did was they had noticed a conserved area in the alpha and beta uh, subunits um, that, uh, uh, that they then brought together other proteins that are known to employ ATP in catalysis and found across very disparate range of proteins a conserved block here. Um, and I don't know if there's many papers that show these sorts of conserved domains that from before 1982. It's sort of pre-gen bank, although many of these uh, proteins were really conceptual translations of DNA sequences, so I'm going to count it. Um, and I think that this was, this was in general how sequence similarities were being discovered at the time. There was no database search. Uh, this was a case where similar function um, uh, at the biochemical level uh, led uh, a very savvy sequence gazer or sequence grazer to bring them together and, and, and uh, find these relatively subtle similarities. Um, this is from uh, our CDD database. Uh, Aaron Mockler Bauer gave me this. And I think what's interesting um, here is the 3D structure around uh, the ATP binding site, and, 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 and in yellow is where they are in three dimension, and, and here's on the sequences. But uh, although this is one of the first motifs, it's probably the most common, and uh, over half a million sequences in Entree, uh, almost 3% of the sequences have one of these domains in it. Well. This next discovery by Margaret Dayhoff, and her name is coming up over and over again, and for good reason. She is really um, the pioneer in bioinformatics because of her discoveries both with uh, uh, 
basic research computational biology discoveries, developing uh, algorithms and tools, and, and, and uh, also uh, developing information resources. Um, and, and in this case, this would seem to be something that should have made the news. This was, as I understand it, possibly the first discovery where you're finding a, 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 an evolutionary relationship between a transforming protein from a viral uh, 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 Maloney sarcoma virus, uh, so a cancer-causing virus, with uh, the, uh, a region of a, of a normal protein, a protein in a normal cell. Um, what she wrote in the abstract was that the relationship was consistent with a high hypothesis that the SARC genes originated in the host genomes in which they are members of a superfamily of distantly related protein kinases that are normal constituents of mammalian cells. So this was a, a, a big finding, but actually it didn't make much play and it wasn't covered in the media at all. Um, and the reason why can be seen in this figure, it's kind of hard to see, but down below on the, on the bottom here is the identical residues. This is a relatively subtle relationship, about 22 percent identity. And so for something like this, this was really too subtle for most biologists to just accept right away. And, 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 and I was thinking about um, Bruno Strasser's talk about the experimentalists versus the natural history type uh, uh, biologists. Um, in, in, in this sense, somebody who really did a lot of comparative analysis would feel very comfortable because they, they kind of knew the context, they had a perspective on it, that this was real. But for experimentalists, this was just, this wasn't, this wasn't uh, strong enough. On the other hand, within a couple years, an experimental group did go ahead and confirm uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the sort of prediction, if you will, in, in the paper. The following year, though, uh, is uh, the sort of first, you know, it's the archetype discovery made by computer searching um, and uh, actually had almost all the ingredients in it of, 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 of a lot of what we saw in the following years, the competition between two groups, um, the, uh, actually the, the uh, slide has been destroyed somehow and, 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 and you cannot tell, but these sequences are almost identical. This is the, the V-cis oncogene being shown to be nearly identical to the platelet drive growth factor. Um, so this made it uh, into the New York Times, the Washington Post. Uh, I love the uh, uh, way this was described, a serendipitous computer search. Um, <laughs> I just, uh, well, it, it, it certainly was. The story behind it was actually uh, quite good, and that's some of the reason why it made it in the newspapers. Um, Russ Doolittle was a real pioneer along with Margaret in, 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 in doing comparative analysis of sequences, the sort of natural history of sequences. And um, Russ had his own database that he built and his own computer tools, and he would take new sequences when he got them. Sometimes he would contact research groups or they would contact him. Sometimes he'd take them from papers. And he com did a computer search himself, and uh, he describes a nice story about when this hit his son somehow had done the run or whatever, and it was kind of a nice little story, uh, very exciting. Um, but across the ocean, actually somewhat before that, Mike Waterfield's group had um, done this quite different way. Uh, Russ was a professional sequence uh, searcher. Um, Mike Waterfield's group had contacted me some months before this. Uh, I had developed a tool with uh, John Wilbur for uh, rapidly sequencing, uh, rapidly searching DNA databases and protein databases, and I had sent them uh, a tape with the, the program on it and some of the databases on it, and, um, and uh, didn't hear anything from them until I saw this, uh, uh, this in the newspaper. And uh, uh, the story gets a little more interesting because apparently he was sitting on the results and trying to um, uh, move forward doing some experiments on the VSIS. Uh, he had been doing work on platelet-derived growth, growth factor, uh, and one of his postdocs was at a meeting out in California, heard Mike Hunkapiller, small world, uh, one of the main figures in, uh, in uh, sequencing machines, give a talk about this result because it was uh, in Lee Hood's lab. Uh, they had done the work on, on uh, PDGF. Um, and he immediately went to a phone and called uh, Mike Waterfield to tell him that they're going to be scooped. Mike Waterfield was apparently on some island vacation, but he managed to get through, and they, they beat them by about one week with the paper. I eventually got a phone call from Russ Doolittle trying to follow up and find out exactly when I sent all this information to Mike Waterfield. 
So many of the things that, that the competition among groups, the, all, all of the behind the scenes events were going on with this one. And this was a case where it really was a serendipitous computer search. Okay, now we're gonna skip ahead a number of years and look at a case that represents a sort of a, a, another flavor of discovery with the databases. The, the breast cancer uh, gene or genes, uh, that was a, a really competitive battle. There were a number of groups working on it. There was uh, all kinds of uh, uh, lead ups to this. And uh, when Mary uh, Clara King and coworkers uh, published this paper, it was very exciting. They had the genetics, they had everything, but they published this noting that there was a sequence similarity to a protein family called the granins, which was a little bit hard to interpret. It was not that strong a similarity, and uh, it was a little unclear for, for those who were into sequence comparison reading the paper if this, was, if this really was uh, a significant sequence homology. Um, I don't remember exactly. I think it was Stephen Altschul had looked at the paper, and he was a little dubious about, about it, and he talked to Eugene Koonin and Pierre Bork, uh, was visiting uh, NCBI at the time, and they'd been working on some, uh, there had been some work on some newer tools for sequence comparison, uh, and what they saw that struck them was that there was a subtle but interesting uh, uh, match with uh, a family of DNA damage repair proteins that you'd really only see easily if you broke the BRCA1 protein up into components of finding the sort of low complexity regions in between and using that to chop it up. And they then, so they found a pattern of uh, subtle blast P hits, and then they got some more convincing evidence with uh, some motif methods and published this, uh, this uh, uh, letter in, in, in Nature, or Nature Genetics. Um, but this was a subtle finding, and it sort of took pro-sequence comparison folks to do it. I mean, whenever I'd sit and look at sequences with Eugene Koonin or Aravind or Ira in my group, I always feel like, you know, Watson, but not the Watson of Watson and Crick, but the Watson of Sherlock Holmes and, and Watson, because I just, you know, it's elementary, uh, David. Um, but they're, they're actually pretty polite when they say it. Um, well, now we know that the BRCT domain, in fact, is actually all over the place. This is, uh, again, from uh, uh, a tool developed by Steve Bryant's group, CD Tree, and they use this for curating the CDD database. But what we see is that among all, pretty much all the eukaryotes, or a wide range of them, and, and, and this is, so this is the, uh, an organism tree, this is a gene tree, and we see a uh, quite diverse uh, set of uh, protein family there, and, and we also see it in the prokaryotes, and um, a broad representation there as well. And if we look, this is uh, uh, from the CDART database. The blue rectangle is the uh, uh, BRCT domain. And uh, the other sort of uh, cartoon uh, blocks are, are actually uh, other kinds of domains. So we see the BRCT domain is very well represented in a number of contexts. And, and it's kind of funny because it was one of those cases where at first you don't see anything and then you see it everywhere. So after 1982, um, there were lots of interesting and important sequence matches. Um, and, and, and really, biologists almost all expected to see an interesting match if they got a new, uh, new gene sequence. Um, I think that uh, these discoveries provided some of the most important justification for the Genome Project. Now, in reality, the Human Genome Project was largely pushed by geneticists. And I, you know, again, getting back to Bruno uh, Strasser's talk, you know, I think some of the strongest justification was really the sort of natural history kind, which was folks like Russ Doolittle and others making uh, these very interesting comparative analyses that, that when extrapolated, uh, scientists could learn a huge amount or get very good hints about what, what, what experiments to do next. Um, and I, I have to say, I wasn't planning on telling this in the talk, and it's unfortunate that Francis isn't here, but there was a very, a meeting, a famous meeting that they had out uh, towards Dulles, um, w where uh, David Baltimore was uh, engaged in, in sort of the, trying to push NIH to really take a lead role in the Human Genome Project. And a variety of scientists were talking about what could be discovered and how it's relevant for uh, NIH. And um, 
Russ Doolittle talked a little bit um, about uh, the kind of comparative analyses that would be possible and the similarities that would be found that could be so useful and interesting. And, it, and what was interesting to me is while I found it fascinating, most of the, genetic, the geneticists there really did not seem that interested in it. Um, they saw the main justification as the gene hunting, uh, uh, speeding up the gene hunting that they were doing. And, um, uh, and I think it, that, that, that chasm between the experimentalists or geneticists and the natural history type comparative analysis folks uh, was, was very, very easy to see there. So when we actually started in on the genome project and sequences started to mount up from bacteria, from, uh, from yeast, from the ESTs, the question is what would we learn, what would be the natural history when we really had much more comprehensive data sets? Instead of picking out a hit here or there, if we really could have all the genes or most of the genes of an organism. Um, and uh, I want to relate a story now uh, uh, of, of, of an exciting period in NCBI where we got our hands on, um, actually I had come back from a trip to Japan and uh, bumped into uh, Jean-Michel Clavery, who uh, was uh, uh, a, a researcher at, NIH, uh, at NCBI at the time. And he and Mark Boguski had gotten their hands on a bunch of new gene sets. Um, basically, they'd gotten uh, some worm ESTs from uh, Ventures Group and from the Wash U Group. Uh, they had uh, human ESTs from uh, Craig Venters Group. I think this was while he was still at NIH. Um, they, they had uh, uh, some of the yeast uh, genome sequence, um, and, uh, uh, and what, what, what Jean-Michel had done is he was comparing always across a, a fairly long evolutionary time, worm ESTs against human ESTs or worm ESTs against the yeast genome sequence and so forth, and any match that would be found would be considered a sort of, a, let's call it an ancient conserved region. What he said to me is, you know, we have all this new sequence but we're not really finding anything new. And I said, what? He said, yeah, it's kind of disappointing. Whenever we do a comparison and we find a match, say, between human and worm or worm and yeast, so that's some conserved protein, we check against the database to see if it's a new protein family. And when we check, it's almost never new. It's already in the database. So it seems like we're not getting that much new out of these, uh, out of these data. And there was really thousands of sequences in this data set. It was a very large and diverse set of sequences. Um, and I told him, I said, well, you know, either there's something incredibly interesting going on here or you made a mistake. So he went back over and, and, and looked at the data again and ran his scripts again and so forth, and he came out with the same result, which you can basically see in this last column, which is that if you looked at the worm ESTs and the human ESTs, for example, you found a number of pairs that match, uh, and you could cluster them down into about 34 classes of ancient conserved region or ancient, uh, and, and we call them that because they are at least as old as the metazoan uh, radiation. And of the ones that they found um, in this top row, 90% uh, were already in the database. So even though there were all these new sequences, we found almost no new uh, conserved families. And this was true down the line in all these cases. And what it suggested, uh, and I should say that, that we got very excited about it, uh, but we were in conversations with Phil Green at Wash U, and it turns out he was doing similar kind of work, and so we decided to work together. And it, the bottom line here was that clearly there were very few conserved protein families, at least in that part of the tree of life that we were looking at. Um, and the reason why we could, we could assume that is that since we had such a small sampling of the genes of any organism, and yet, uh, when we got this big new data set, almost everything that we found was already in the database. That suggested that there simply weren't that many uh, conserved families. The other observation in this data set that was very interesting uh, was that the ESTs that appeared multiple times in our set, in other words, they were sort of redundant copies, and therefore that, that gene was expressed fairly high in that tissue, um, they had a higher chance of having an ACR, and their matches were stronger than those that were found if you only had one EST. And you could see that uh, if you looked at the strength of the matches for ESTs that appeared once or twice or three times, it got stronger. So that indicated that there was a positive correlation between conservation, protein conservation, and expression. 
That observation has turned out that I, I don't, I'm not aware of any prior publication of that, that observation. And that has turned out to be really a very powerful observation. It, many people have refined it, have, have made it more comprehensive. And in fact, on the order of say 35 to 40 or 50 percent of the variance in conservation can be explained by expression level. Nothing else, no other property that we know of correlates anywhere, anywhere near as good with conservation as expression level. That's, although we put in some explanation in the paper for that or some possible explanation and everybody can throw up explanations for things, um, we really found it puzzling and, and, and until recently I don't think anybody had a good explanation, but I do feel there is one out there and uh, that's a topic of another talk. There was another aspect of this that I thought was of interest, and, and I think people kind of never really um, focused on enough, and, and it was clear in, in Craig Venter's talk, um, and almost anybody who does large-scale sequencing, which is that many of the new genes don't match anything, and since there's a relatively small number of conserved families, and, and, and it looked like we had most of them, if many of the genes don't match anything, it means that a good fraction of the genes in any organism likely are evolving fast enough, they're not well conserved, that they are not going to uh, uh, match anything outside of a very closely, another closely, very closely related organism. And so the, what this study tells us is that there's a distribution of, of uh, evolutionary rates for the genes of, 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 of organisms. And uh, those, there's a relatively small set of proteins that are evolving slowly and they're shared among many, many uh, organisms and account for a number of the genes. And then there's a, a subset which, and I'll, I'll get into this in a minute, minute that uh, evolve very rapidly and you wouldn't expect to be able to find matches unless you're looking at very closely related organisms. Uh, well, we did not refer to these two papers. Part of the problem is they weren't online and we didn't know to search for them. But in fact, there had been earlier estimates of the number of protein families, which were about the same number that we estimated. And they were done independently uh, by Emil Zuckerkondel and again, Margaret Dayhoff. Um, they were in somewhat obscure, certainly this one in 74 uh, uh, journals. Um, and they made these observations on the basis of serendipitous similarities, unexpected similarities that were found back then. The amount of data they had to work on was very low. These were um, experts in comparative analysis, I would say. Um, and I don't think that most scientists paid a lot of attention to them. In fact, uh, I think that, uh, remember talking to a scientist at NIH once about some of Margaret Dayhoff's predictions. This is when I first came to NIH. And he said, oh, that's sort of like methods that people use when they're trying to decide where to drill for oil. They don't know what they're doing. Um, but uh, 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 these, these have been fairly accurate, I think. And um, I just want to point out in particular this paper here uh, by Zuckerkondel. It's an extremely interesting and forward-looking paper. Many of the questions that I'm puzzling about now with sequences, he really discusses uh, in this paper. So uh, these are worth looking up. Okay. So if, if many of the new sequences could match into a small set of conserved protein families, then classification of protein families uh, becomes quite useful and feasible. All right. If there's too many different cases, then you really don't learn a lot by classification because you're not going to, you know, knowledge on one protein isn't going to ex extend to other related proteins very much because there'd only be a few of them. Uh, if there's a, a, a very, very small set of, of conserved uh, protein families, then the fact that somebody's falling into the same family isn't going to tell you that much uh, because everything's sort of lumped together. Now, Dayhoff was a pioneer of protein classification. Uh, she had developed her superfamily classification scheme, and that was really based on percent similarity. Um, and it was in some ways kind of arbitrary. I, I, I think it's, it, 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 it actually did have some natural order to it, but, but there was aspects of this that were uh, arbitrary, and that was because really she had not at all comprehensive data sets to work with. Um, but with a growing number of microbial genomes, um, in discussion with Eugene Koonin, um, I felt that a genomic approach at protein classification would now be possible and obviously be very helpful for us as a database 
uh, group, if we could have uh, a scheme for classifying proteins, it would help with annotation, it would help with quality control, and so forth. That led to uh, this paper um, and, and the idea of uh, a cluster of, of orthologous genes, the COG. Um, and the basic idea behind that um, is fairly simple. Um, here we have, uh, uh, we're comparing all the genes for three organisms, and this is a particular gene that we're looking at. Um, and what we've done is, for each organism, we know the best hit into, so for example, for yeast to coli, we know the best, uh, the best match for each sequence. And so for this sequence, the best match in all of coli was this particular sequence here. And if we turned around and looked at it from coli's point of view, if it, it could be that the best hit for this sequence was this one. Whenever we found a case like that, we called it a symmetric best hit. And that, that was an occasion where we'd have some reason to believe that maybe in the common ancestor, the closest common ancestor of yeast and coli, there was a single gene. And that's the definition of an ortholog. But we'd have more confidence if, if this, this kind of relationship was was reinforced by a third organism, where in this case this was synexistus, and what, we, what we're looking at is uh, 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 the best match, if the, we have a symmetric best, best match for, for these two, and they are both pointing to the same one for a symmetric best hit into this third organism, then we would consider that a, a, a triangle of best hits, and we called that our, our minimal or elementary cog. We wouldn't feel we'd have enough confidence unless we had three organisms, a gene from each one, where, where we found this kind of unequivocal relationship. There's more sophisticated methods that people have come up with since, but this was a convenient method, and it worked fairly well. That was the easiest kind of case. If you have a lot of uh, gene duplication, post subsequent to the time of the uh, uh, closest common ancestor, you'd have a more complicated picture and you'd have to take into account um, uh, gene duplication, but still most cases it was possible to do this and make fairly clean clusters of orthologous genes. And the idea would be that if we had some information on one or more of the members of a, of a cog, we could use that, we could give names to these cogs, and then when a new organism came out, we could use this set of clusters, and instead of comparing against just independent individual sequences, we could really look at consistency with an entire set of already organized sequences. Um, this is a result from a, uh, an update uh, of the COGS, uh, and uh, Yuri Wolf and, and Eugene Kunin uh, put this together. And what we have here are the bars represent the fraction of genes in a variety of microbes that match into the COG set. And what we can see is that in some cases, we have very low, less than 50% of the genes are matching into the COG set. And that's really telling you that you've sampled a part of the tree of life here, a bacteria or, some, or an archaeal organism, which is very far away evolutionarily from every, everything else. And so uh, uh, given that distribution of evolutionary rates for proteins, many of these you just can't detect anymore. Um, in other cases, you have very complete, nearly complete sets. So for example, mycoplasma, virtually all the genes, it's sort of a minimal organism, it can't fool around, and so virtually all the, the, the genes are, are, are matching into, this, uh, 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 into the COGS. So because of that, what that tells you is that by doing a certain computational analysis like this, you can classify many of the genes of the organism into a set and extrapolate in some cases about function. But you can also look at things like this. You can take a, a, a pathway, um, like this glycolysis pathway, and for every step, a catalytic step, note what, what, uh, uh, what cog uh, is, is uh, uh, represented in that step. Okay, and in some cases, there are alternates. You can have two different protein, two different cogs for the same step, or you might have one or the other. And this is sort of a, a, a good step towards a systems biology because you can immediately look at, 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 at organisms of different types that are living in different environments and very quickly see what sort of um, systems are fully intact in them or how they've changed. Uh, uh, parasites may have uh, a, a different uh, pattern in terms of their pathways than free living microbes and so forth. Um, but one of the things that comes out from this sort of thing, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this part of this, is that, um, that uh, we like to think of these systems as sort of a higher unit of meaning. It's sort of like a hierarchy. We have the genes, the building blocks, 
and then we have these pathways, and then we have ass and assemblies, and then, the, then we go on to the next layer and layer until we have a, a set of hierarchies and modular units that, that actually are what build up the whole organism. That's certainly what um, the kind of work that Craig is talking about, and anybody who's worked in systems biology to a greater or lesser extent really likes to think about these like. But what we've learned by doing these kinds of comparisons is we find that these are maybe more of an intellectual construct for us than really representing a natural unit of meaning in living, living things because they just fall apart fairly quickly. You find, you find missing steps in many organisms or you find di completely different unrelated proteins playing the role uh, that they would ordinarily play in the more well-studied organisms. So it's not really clear that these represent a unit of meaning, at least from the point of view of nature. Well, as one had more comprehensive data sets and the ability to classify these, it was possible to start to see some larger scale, coarse grained uh, picture of evolution, uh, certainly for the microbial world. And this is a, a very interesting paper uh, uh, by Kunin and his coworkers that um, by doing a, a number of, of, of comparisons, uh, they, they, they felt that there was quite a, a, a quite a large scale amount of lateral transfer, horizontal transfer of genes from, uh, from the bacteria into the archaea. Um, there were some, because of the incompleteness of the data set, there were some aspects of the analysis that are also, I would say, incomplete. But uh, they followed that up with a paper which was much more clear cut, where they found evidence for massive gene transfer the other direction, from the bacteria into the archaea, from one kingdom to another kingdom. Um, and uh, in this particular case, uh, the sort of uh, Darwinian aspect of it was somewhat clear, at least. And that was that uh, archaea, many of them live at very high temperatures. They're able to live that way. They have many adaptations to do that. And, but we find bacteria that also are, are hyperthermophiles that also can live at high temperature. And what was found um, uh, was that uh, bacteria that were living at high temperature had taken up a large number of genes from the, from the hypothermophilic archaeal organism. It, this violates a lot of one's notion about, about a neat, modular, hierarchical view of evolution uh, if you can take these building blocks and just move them around and they work. Uh, just to, to, to depict this a little bit, uh, every dot here represents a gene. This is the entire genome of Archaeoglobus. And um, if we, uh, Archaeoglobus is an archaeal uh, organism, and in yellow, if we take the best hit for every, uh, every gene, if the best hit is into um, a, a, another archaeal organism, then we'll color it yellow. And so we see most of the best hits for Archaeoglobus are other, are other archaea. But we'll color them blue if the best hit is, back, is from the bacterial group. And what we can see is quite a few uh, clusters of blue in this archaeal organism. So this was lateral transfer from the bacteria into the archaea. And we can look at it the other way around. Aquifex is a hypothermophilic bacteria. Um, and uh, most of its genes are blue. OK, so the best hits are in the bacteria. But you have quite a few uh, best hits into the archaea, which, which uh, presumably were part of its adaptation to high temperature. Um, I'm going to skip through this. This is just another way of, of, of showing that. I, I, I'm going to have to skip through fairly quickly right now um, and just point out this is from work from uh, Arvind and, and his colleagues on uh, uh, nitric oxide, uh, the NO receptor. And what they dis discovered was that the NO receptor, something which is in, in, in the animals, and we tend to think of something in the higher organisms, so to speak, um, that the, that domain is actually widespread in the bacteria. It's quite diverse. And the, the uh, phyletic pattern here and, uh, and the phylogenetic relationships suggest that there was lateral transfer from the bacteria into the animals. Now, likely an early sister or early early ancestor that was uh, single-celled possibly, but in any case, the lateral transfer is not only happening between the archaea and the bacteria, but also with the eukaryotes. Uh, there are other cute examples of this, um, and I'm just going to say briefly that uh, one other part of this that's of interest, and I won't explain this 
this slide, but this is a very interesting paper, we would tend to think that maybe sort of genes that are kind of on the periphery, not in the, at the core levels of the hierarchy, that you could have lateral transfer for those swapping in and out. They probably won't hurt anything, it's okay. But you wouldn't think of it at the heart of the ribosome. And yet this work, um, uh, this paper here uh, shows quite convincingly that in fact there's lateral transfer um, even uh, for ribosomal proteins. So what is this all telling us all about biological systems? Um, so I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, go too crazy here, but I'd like to. But what I would say is that that uh, uh, if you if you take, um, I think it was uh, was it Sid, uh, Sydney? No, it was uh, David Botstein, and his talk was talking about a card. It's interesting. I'd already made the slide. If we if we imagine. So, and I swear that, I really did. If we imagine this Toyota Prius, and we take 25% of its parts out, and we try to replace them with parts from my first car, 65 Ford Galaxy. Um, <laughs> that was my girlfriend. Um, sorry. <laughs> you know, well, how would we do this? Well, I posed this to my wife. You know, how we, you know, she didn't like this, this, this girl, so that's another story. But anyway, um, how, how would we, you know, move these parts from the Ford Galaxy to the Prius. Well, you could imagine possibly changing the tires, maybe the steering wheel. Um, uh, but, you know, for a lot of the, we might even be able to take the body and kind of bolt it on some crazy way. But in general, it would be very hard to move the parts across. And, and if these were more closely related cars, like a, uh, like a Toyota Corolla and a, mm, let's see, a Toyota Matrix, maybe they're made on the same frame, maybe a lot of the parts are the same and only certain parts are separate, what we would see is that what we could move and mix and match there would be very restricted. There'd be, it'd be very clearly modular. There'd be some parts where they're absolutely identical, we've kept them absolutely identical, and other parts where we can move them around. But what we see when we're looking at um, uh, lateral transfer or what we see in terms of uh, of, of uh, mutational rates and, and the, the loss of genes and so forth is that that seems to be spread all over the place. While it seems to be less likely that you can do that at the very core of things like the ribosome, even though it is possible there, once you get out of a, you know, maybe the translational machinery and so forth, there's a lot of swapping around. And it's kind of hard to reconcile that with our notion of other systems. And it's kind of hard to reconcile that with the notion that some of these proteins seem so well conserved, uh, everything has to be just so for it to work, and yet somehow or other, in some cases, it's gone completely. In other cases, they've swapped in another gene. So I would just say, echoing a little bit what Sidney uh, uh, Brenner was saying, um, is that I am somewhat less optimistic about the simplicity of doing systems biology than David Botstein is, and, and I think it's going to be very difficult to to push ahead with high throughput biology at the level of phenotype um, uh, simply because uh, biological systems are really noisy systems that most phenotypic change is likely to be neutral and not selected for. And the, because of that, biological systems aren't very hierarchical and they aren't very modular. And that means that the amount you're going to need to know in order to really sort of model these things and to predict things is a tremendous amount. So we've got a lot of work. Uh, we've got our jobs are, 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 are still going to be here 10 or 20 years from now, I think, uh, because this is a very challenging problem. OK. Very quickly. So the future. Well, I'm going to see more sequence is what I think the future is. And, and it relates to what happened in the computer world. As the cost of computers decreased, the overall investment in computers increased. And the reason why is because we use computers now for things that we never would have imagined back here. All right. um, I mean, we have computers, you know, in, 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 in earrings now. For, and, 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 but back here, you'd only use them for designing atomic bombs. And I think we're seeing the same thing with sequencing. That as sequencing gets cheaper and cheaper, we will use it for things that we never would have imagined before in the past. Now, some of the, some of the people talk about, well, how will the sequence databases keep up and whatever else? Well, clearly, you know, keeping every single base is not going to be the goal. In fact, this is a type of functional annotation we're going to be seeing, and that's how it's going to be treated. And we're going to, we'll come up with ways to keep the data that's needed to, in order for people to make discoveries. Uh, and we're actually looking forward to the challenge and the opportunities of all this new data. Uh, thank you very much.
They're too tired. You're too tired. That's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm saying goodbye to you all. So I was told to say thank you very much for participating. We, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, to have you all here and uh, uh, for the speakers. Thank you very much again.